Hi, everyone. My name is Hannah Rauhanen. I'm the Ottawa IHN Campus Manager and Program Advisor. Uh, we are so thrilled to have Marla Samuel here with us today. She will be lecturing on small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and intestinal methanogen overgrowth, uh, what we need to know about these forms of gut dysbiosis, uh, and what we can do to heal. So uh, Marla is a certified nutritional practitioner. She graduated from the IHN North York campus in 2002. Um, she did mention briefly her educational background. It's quite impressive, a master's of science, a bachelor of arts, psychology and training in homeopathy. Uh, she has over 20 years of experience working with clients that suffer uh, from digestive issues and hormone imbalances. So Marla, I'll let you elaborate a little bit more on that. And uh, after the lecture today, we'll be doing a Q&A. And if you have any questions, please feel free to put them uh, in the Q&A section um, as opposed to the chat feature here in Zoom. And then Marla is also doing a wonderful giveaway after the Q&A. Uh, it's a $100 coupon to apply to any of her online courses. Uh, so I'll let her uh, dive a little bit deeper into that as well. So Marla, why don't you take it away? Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> so it's nice to meet you virtually. Um, I think she's covered all the basis in terms of my um, education background. Um, the main thing, just so you know, today is we actually are going to be focusing on what is SIBO, a couple of underlying risk factors, and also we will be talking about um, some diets. Today is a diet day. So if you want to learn more about um, the actual underlying risk factors and where are you going to go with that in terms of how you're going to treat this specifically, I would recommend that you can join my course. I have a course for specifically for nutritionists, which is really exciting for me because I love to share this with you. I have protocols and strategies to make you a pro in SIBO and IMO. And you can look online at my website. It's, it's actually spelled Marla, M-A-R-L-A, Samuel, S-A-M-U-E-L, Dot com, marlasamuel.com, and you can register for the course. There is one coming up on March 15th or 16th, I believe. All right, so let's get started. Today's objectives, we are going to cover what is SIBO and IMO, seven supportive diets for SIBO and IMO, and the comparison of diets, and how to test for SIBO and IMO. A lot of people ask me that. They're saying, how can I test for this? My doctor won't do it. Well, we will learn about that today. All right, so what is SIBO? Well, SIBO stands for small intestine bacterial overgrowth. It actually occurs when there's benign, meaning not disease forming, normal bacteria that normally grow in large amounts in the large intestine. So it's not growing in the small, it's not supposed to grow in a small intestine, but it is. So this bacteria that's supposed to be in the large intestine is growing and fermenting in your small intestine. So hence the name, small intestine bacterial overgrowth. All right, there are certain bacteria and microorganisms which create gas as a byproduct of fermentation. This gas causes bloating. That's the kind of the hallmark symptom is bloating. And usually I hear people say, well, the bloating is worse late in the day, like later in the part of the day. So you want to listen for that symptom for sure. But bloating can also occur after eating. There's pain, there may be diarrhea and or constipation, along with a slew of different like mental, emotional symptoms, which you'll get into on the next slide. SIBO can also lead to malnutrition because the bacteria that starts to grow is actually impeding the absorptive ability because it's actually damaging the lining of epithelial cells. So we're not getting the nutrients that we need. So when you have SIBO, which is related to a diarrhea or loose stools, you're going to lose weight. So that's kind of what we don't want to have, right? All right, IMO. This is really new. So people are like, oh my gosh, what is IMO? Isn't it all SIBO? It's not because IMO stands for intestinal methanogen overgrowth. And methanogens are not bacteria, so you can't call it small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and you can't call it SIIMO because this one is actually can be in your large intestine as well as your small intestine. But let's backtrack here for a minute. So when archaea, which are microorganisms, they are not bacteria, they eat an excess of hydrogen gas, and this produces methane gas. 
So that's why we call it intestinal methanogen overgrowth. The name of the non-bacteria microorganism is called specifically Methanobrevibacter smithi, or short form M. smithi, or if you want to call it Mr. Smith, just to remember <laughs> what the name of bacteria is. So methane can exist in both the small intestine, that's what SI stands for, and LI for large intestine. This excess methane causes constipation generally. So remember I just mentioned how SIBO diarrhea will cause, I mean, SIBO will cause a diarrhea. Well, IMO causes more constipation. So excess methanogens cause the opposite. It causes more weight gain because you have that gas being built up. Let's go through some SIBO myths you may have read online. And I know with my research, there's all kinds of like different theories about SIBO, what is it, what it's not. So I've spent hours and hours and books and years you know, studying this. So let's just be clear about the myth. SIBO is not an infection, technically, but it does behave like an opportunistic infection because it does relate to inflammation. It does cause problems like it's an infection. You can get sick and fever, but it's not an infection, just to be clear. And SIBO is not a disease. It's rather a symptom of an underlying disease. So that's why it's really good when someone comes to you with SIBO, you say, uh-huh, there must be something underlining this as well as just having SIBO. SIBO is also a case of having too many benign bacteria living in the wrong neighborhood of your gut as opposed to having the, the wrong bacteria. It's not about, sorry, not about wrong. It's about, your, you can have the bacteria in your small intestine. It just can't be so many of them. So there's way too many of these bad bacteria or we call microorganisms living in your gut. All right, in general, on the bottom here, your small intestine should have less bacteria than your large intestine and far less total bacteria than your large intestine. So I, didn't, I couldn't find the exponent symbol, but small intestine is 10 to the exponent three milliliters, and the large intestine should have 10 to the exponent nine in milliliters. So I, put, I had to write out all the zeros for you. All right, let's talk about what other diseases are SIBO and IMO associated with. And there are many, 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 just so you know, I'm just kind of skimming them over today because this course that I'm offering online uh, live is six weeks. And if you want to talk to students who have completed my course, it is jam packed <laughs> and we talk a lot about stuff. So again, I can't cover all of the associated diseases today, but the main ones to listen out for with your client is you can find a quite ask a question, say, do you have hypothyroidism? Do you have rheumatoid arthritis? Do you have restless leg syndrome? Do you have rosacea, non-responsive celiac disease, or fibromyalgia? And in the studies that are showing the connections between SIBO and this are very high. So that's a good thing to watch out for because people who have gut issues, um, and this is a funny one too, if the doctor says, oh, you've got IBS, and you have restless leg syndrome, the chances that you have SIBO are up to 60 to 70%. That's really high. So what I wanna mention something about IBS is that SIBO, uh, a lot of people who come to me say they have IBS. And I'm laughing when I say IBS because it's a disclusion. It's by, you know, they test endoscopies and do colonoscopies. They can't find a thing in the doctor's office. And they say, oh, well, you must have IBS. It's this umbrella term for saying, I am baffled by your symptoms. So for me, 30 years ago, that's what IBS meant for me. They were telling me I am baffled by your symptoms because they had no clue what I had. All right, let's talk about some common symptoms that are experienced with SIBO and IMO. And of course, um, doctors might tell you, this is something you just have to live with. And my quote down here says, this is something that you are not designed to live with, right? That's just, that's just not how it's supposed to go. So you may have headaches. You may have anxiety, depression. You may have nausea and vomiting. You could have bloating, like you look like you're six months pregnant, literally. Uh, gas, pain, cramping. You can have lots of food intolerances and sensitivities. You can have joint and muscle pain, fatigue, diarrhea, constipation, and that can be both. You can have actually 
diarrhea and constipation. But for SIBO case, you're going to have one dominant symptom, diarrhea or constipation. Uh, you can have heartburn, acid reflux, belching, brain fog, memory focus issues as well. Those are just the common symptoms. I have even mentioned other ones, but these are the common ones you're experiencing or can experience with, you, with SIBO. So how do gut bacteria and microorganisms grow in your gut? How does that happen? Well, all carbohydrates feed bacteria, all of them, and they also feed microorganisms so when carbs remain undigested in your gut for a, a long period of time, this feeds the overgrowth of harmful bacteria. So imagine a swamp, right? Like the swamp is not moving. There's no movement there and it's getting kind of gassy and getting kind of smelly. So this is what we're talking about in terms of um, the overgrowth. And the specific bacteria I want to talk about are pathobionts. So pathobionts are gram-negative bacteria. We have gram-negative bacteria and we have commensals, which are gram-positive bacteria. Things like E. coli, Klebsiella, Aromas, and Desulfovibria. These bacteria are in relationship to SIBO. This is what's going to be overgrown in SIBO. This overgrowth can cause inflammation in the gut and lead to a slew of gastro, mental, and emotional symptoms and physical symptoms that we just basically briefed over in the previous slide. So when carbohydrates ferment and cause excess hydrogen gas, in bracket SIBO-D for diarrhea, or hydrogen sulfide dominant in the small intestine, this causes diarrhea. Generally speaking, it's not actually totally clinically proven, but we're gonna go with that for now. All right, we mentioned E. coli, Klebsiella, and Aromonas are now, are, they are gram-negative bacteria, and they're opportunistic. So they are going to uh, proliferate whenever there's a chance. If there's poor gut motility, like your peristalsis is not moving, they're gonna latch on your gut and they're gonna to wanna to stay. It's like a party, because they're not supposed to be in the small intestine. They're supposed to be more in the large intestine. So imagine like kids in a candy factory, right? They're like, woohoo, I wanna stay here forever. And the parents come and they say, guys, it's time to leave now. They're like, no way. And what do they do? They hide in the tent. They hide under the slide. They do not wanna come out of that place because it's it's like candy. Same like these, same similar to these bacteria. They want to stay in your small intestine. It's full of food and carbohydrates. It is a party they're having in there. All right. So this bacteria overgrowth can lead to weight loss, the SIBO, the SIBO diarrhea. Guess what? This slide totally changed my life because I found out just, just from my own symptoms. Uh, years ago that I thought I, you know, didn't know what I had, but here's what it was. So the uh, number one underlying cause of IBS is, drum roll please, SIBO and IMO. 60 to 70%, even some stats go up to 84% of people suffering with IBS actually have SIBO. How is that possible? Well, it's something called post-infectious IBS, and it's from, get this, traveler's diarrhea, food poisoning, or gastroenteritis, otherwise well known as a flu. I mean, who hasn't had those before, those symptoms? That's pretty amazing. All right, this is a slide that I wanna show you. I'm gonna take you step by step, and it shows you how we get food poisoning, sorry, how food poisoning causes SIBO diarrhea, or mixed, meaning constipation and uh, di diarrhea. Okay, food poisoning, you get that. There's certain bacteria that are involved, the V. cholerae, C. jejuni, Shigella, Campylobacter, C. difficile, Salmonella, E. coli. So you're exposed to this. Maybe you had bad pork or bad chicken or whatever meat you had or sushi or seafood and you got sick. So this bacterial toxin is called CDTB, cytolethal distending toxin B. That's the, that's the toxin you're now infected with. So something happens now with your immune system. It does get complicated, but I'm going to try and make it simple. It's called molecular mimicry. They're going to, so your immune system is going to mimic the bacteria that you have in your gut. There's a picture here of a mirror. So your immune system looks at this bacteria and says, hmm, you look familiar. I know you. I'm going to make an antibody. I'm going to build that. Now, the key is 
not everybody has the anti-vinculin antibody, only like only a certain percentage. Let's say 25% only may have this anti-vinculin antibody. Okay. So that's why everybody who gets the flu does not develop SIBO. That's why. So only some have the anti-vinculin antibody. So this is where the autoimmunity stage comes in. So now you are building up an autoimmune fight in your own body with this and with this anti-vinculin antibody. What happens when this? What, what, what's, the, what's the effect of this? Well, it's small intestinal nerve damage. So we have nerves all along in our guts, and this nerve damage is going to affect. The, it reduces your ICC, and that stands for interstitial cells of Cajal within your small intestine and your immune system as well. So when this is damaged, what does this mean now if your nerves are damaged in your gut? Well, your gut has to, has to have a peristaltic motion to get rid of toxins and bacteria, right? And so that is being affected. And what happens is it decreases what's called MMC, migrating motor complex. What is migrating motor complex? It's this wave, electrical wave, that comes through your body that stimulates peristalsis. And so it only happens, MMC only is stimulated when you are not eating, including chewing gum. Chewing gum will not allow MMC to be simulated. So this leads to small intestinal stasis, means stillness, no movement, nothing's moving, it's all still. So it's a perfect breeding ground for bacteria and that's how it grows. So it's called post-infectious IBS. It's treatable with herbs, and or my antibiotics. I do not recommend antibiotics from all the studies I've been doing. Um, you can get it tested. You can test yourself for IBS. There is an IBS blood test in the States. Unfortunately, it's not available here in Canada, but you can do a SIBO breath test. And I will go through that the very last slide. I will give you an email or sorry, a website as to where you can order it from. You can order it yourself. All right. The other way to check for SIBO is you can also get a PCR test, stool test. It's a polymerase stool test. It's more effective than the tests that are offered at your doctor's offices. All right. Let's, the question that be going through your head is, so what produces hydrogen and methane gas in the gut? Where does it come from? We mentioned carbohydrates, but every carbohydrate? Let's take a look. So cheese, dairy, and milk. Yes, that carbohydrate, it's a carbohydrate, lactase, lactose, that can feed SIBO and IMO. What about nice healing bone broth? Yes, <laughs> that, that's a form of carbohydrate, specifically oligosaccharide. Now, this one shocked me because I'm like, oh my God, I thought, you know, gut broth was great. It contained glutamine, proline. It's going to heal my lining of my gut. But because this broth is made with bones, cartilage, connective tissue, knuckles, whatever it is, that breaks down to GAGs, which is um, glucoaminoglycans, which is connective tissue, which is sinewy carbohydrates. So yeah, so healing broth can actually be a problem for SIBO. What about ribs? No, it's definitely carbohydrates. It's got bone, it's got connective tissue, and that's going to be a problem. What about stevia? Isn't stevia good? For, isn't that a better replacement? Well, on a big picture, yes, stevia is better. However, it is still a carbohydrate. So we need to, yeah, you need to think about that. <laughs> then we have junk food. Of course, we think that's the first thing we think of when we think of carbohydrates is all the junk food and processed food. Definitely want to replace, we want to remove that. But what about corn? I mean, vegetables and, and berries and bread. And nuts and seeds, those are carbohydrates too. They're, they can be formed of carbohydrates in that. So yes, all of this is a form of carbohydrate and they can actually make SIBO worse in the beginning. Now there is a caveat in terms of how you treat this. You're like, oh my God, I'm gonna starve myself? No, definitely not. So there are diets and that's why I wanted to talk to you about it today. There are diets, but we'll get that, oops, we'll get that into that just, just a moment. Okay, so let's talk about um, what produces hydrogen and methane in terms of a nice visual. So we know now that all carbohydrates start the process in terms of if you do have that anti-vinculin antibody, that can then lead to SIBO. So as a review, carbs, carbohydrates, feed the bacteria overgrowth. This bacteria overgrowth produces hydrogen gas, and the hydrogen gas then feeds the archaea, 
which were those microorganisms, or it can feed desulfo vibrio. Now, this one is related to hydrogen, a hydrogen um, sulfide form of SIBO. It's still SIBO, okay? And the archaea will produce methane gas. The desulfo vibrio will produce hydrogen sulfide gas. Okay, so let's just backtrack a, a minute here. So hydrogen gas here, we can have SIBO at this stage right here, SIBO right there, hydrogen gas, that could be your SIBO diarrhea. But if hydrogen gas then moves on to different forms of SIBO or IMO, let's talk about that. So hydrogen gas, let's review, feeds archaea. Archaea are microorganisms and that will lead to methane gas. So methane, remember, is related to constipation. Hydrogen gas can also feed desulfo vibrio, and that will produce hydrogen sulfide gas, a different type of, it's still a SIBO, but it's a different type. And I will go over that in just a moment, just so you have a clear idea of how many SIBOs are there, who's causing what. All right, so methane, and ga methane gas, Methane gas and hydrogen sulfide are toxic byproducts from archaea, microorganism, and desulfo vibrio bacteria. These gases are not produced by humans in large amounts, but are the met metabolic byproducts of fermentation of carbohydrates by intestinal bacteria. I just want to make a note here that not everybody is a methane producer, just so you're aware of that. Like maybe half the people are maybe less than are methane producers. So not everyone's going to have a methane um, condition. And in terms of hydrogen sulfide, hydrogen sulfide is in the body in small amounts, just not large amounts. All right. So how does bacteria build up in the small intestine? So there's six main ways. The bacteria is not moved out. It's just still, it's stasis. The clearance of the bacteria, it's not cleared. Bacteria is trapped in places in your small intestine. The back migration from the large intestine to the small intestine may occur. There's called the ileocecal valve, which is the lowest part of your small intestine. And there's a valve that opens to your large intestine. And this valve, ileocecal valve, can get very loose and inflamed. And now the large intestine bacteria kind of come up to the small intestine. So that's what I mean by back migration. You can also have bacteria building up from swallowing with your food. And you can also have where the bacteria is not killed in the gut because of stasis. So that's how it builds up. All right, this is a picture now. So this is your gut when there is no movement and you're no MMC, migrating motor complex, that electric, electronic wave that goes to your body. We call it the housekeeper, the MMC. It only comes to your house. For example, your housekeeper only comes to your house when no one's home. So your housekeeper says to you, guys, you got to leave your house and then I'm going to come and clean it up. So the housekeeper comes along, brings this vacuum cleaner. It sweeps all the dirt down. So imagine metaphorically, the housekeeper is coming down and it's sweeping all the bacteria from your small intestine down to your large intestine to help move it down. That is your MMC, the housekeeper. All right. So there are two types of SIBO and one type of IMO. So number one, hydrogen dominant, that was the diarrhea kind. We call that SIBO. Uh, we'll call that SIBO D. Oops, it is SIBO, SIBO D. I forgot to put the D in there. Uh, then we have new kind is hydrogen do sulfide dominant, and that's a SIBO. I didn't put any letter to it. You could put it in SIBO H if you want to remember SIBO hydrogen sulfide, um, and that's new. There's a third kind. This is not a SIBO. This is called IMO, intestinal methanogen overgrowth because we have methanes. And again, we can't call it bacterial because it's not bacteria, it's archaea. All right, you can have mixed. You can have one may dominate, like one hydrogen may dominate, or you may have constipation that dominates. So one, you can have both at the same time. Very rarely can you have all three, hydrogen dominant, hydrogen sulfide, and methane dominant at the same time. It's extremely rare, but it does occur. All right, let's summarize now the SIBO causes before we move into our diets that we're going to use to treat SIBO. So number one, the most common cause is post-infectious IBS. We have up here, post-infectious IBS. 
Number two, adhesions. What are adhesions? Well, this is caused by abdo abdominal surgery or endometriosis when part of your pelvic tissue gets um, glued basically with connective tissue to your, to your abdominal area. So you have this very strong sinewy connective tissue. And what happens in between here? Bacteria starts to grow and it gets trapped. PCOS may be, may be a possibility, polycystic ovarian syndrome, appendicitis, IBD is inflammatory bowel disease. You may have traumas or blows or injuries to your abdomen. And that can cause um, adhesions and things that stick together. And narcotics, that's pretty big too, in terms of why even, even um, pain medications can cause um, SIBO. And I think I want to mention some more drugs here as well. I want to mention uh, PPIs, which are proton pump inhibitors. This is when someone goes to the doctor and says, doctor, I've got some GERD, I've got some burning, I've got, I've got some acid coming up. What does the doctor do? Gives them PPIs, proton pump inhibitors, to decrease the hydrochloric acid. Well, we know that hydrochloric acid is sterilizing. It sterilizes that bacteria. And now with that drug, you've now depleted your ability to sterilize. So you've got a nice smelling gut in there because nothing's breaking down. So that's a problem, proton pump inhibitors. Okay, the most common physiologic underlying, oh, I spelled that wrong, underlying cause is deficient MMC, it's your housekeeper, it's a slow motility. The second one would be structural anatomic issues or partial obstructions, like blind loop. Think about diverticulitis, you know those loops in diverticuli that causes nice, nice little hoops attached to your intestine. What are you not supposed to eat? Seeds and things, because seeds and, and stuff get caught and trapped, and then the bacteria starts to overgrow. Um, causes of deficient MMC, migrating motor complex, could be food poisoning, opiates, antibiotics, diabetes, hypothyroidism, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. That's a new one for me uh, since I started this study. Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is when you got the contortionist, you know, the gymnast who can like go like this. They can put their legs behind their arms. You know, it's a connective tissue problem. And so it, your connective tissue is actually strong enough in their gut to have peristalsis. And that leads to all kinds of um, balls and loops and traps of bacteria. Lyme disease can also be a cause of deficient MMC. Parkinson's disease, again, lack of dopamine, scleroderma, scleroderma, which is an autoimmune disease, traumatic brain injury. Now, this was interesting. I'm like, why would a brain injury cause SIBO? Well, that's because we have nerves that are connected to your gut. And if the nerve signals are not being sent, then you will not have, you will not have movement in your, your gut. Parasites also very common a co-infection with SIBO. Why? Because parasites love the bacteria environment as well, and they want to hang out there. And what do they do when you've got these gram-negative bacteria? They party with them. They're like, yeah, I'm in here. And what do they do? They hide under the mucus lining in your epithelial cells, and they cause damage. All righty. Let's now shift into SIBO diet goals. <laughs> All right. So now we're shifting a bit. Now you've got, a, you had a 30 minute <laughs> quick overview of what SIBO is, some, some underlying causes and an introduction to SIBO. So if you are interested and you do want to know more, I do, um, like I mentioned, have this course. You can um, apply or look, look at it, see if it appeals to you. But I do guarantee that after six weeks, you will have a clear understanding of how you can treat it. And especially for digestive clients. And I, I find that all the handouts that you get is just uh, amazing in terms of um, saving you so much time. Okay, what are the main goals of a SIBO diet? So number one, this is to decrease bacterial fermentation and increase nutrient absorption. This is, this is key, right? We want our bodies to get as much nutrition as possible. And we also want fermentation. Some fermentation by bacteria is normal and the healthy, in the healthy gut, but excessive fermentation, not so good. Number two, we want to allow time between eating to give your migrating water complex, your housekeeper, a chance to clean the house. So research has been showing that um, having a decrease in cleansing waves 
can be an underlying cause of bacterial overgrowth, which we mentioned before. And we also want to allow four to five hours between your meals to allow that MMC to be doing its job. You know, got to leave the house, let the cleaning person come to your house and do its job properly. So nighttime is when you have the longest period of fasting. So it may help not you know, help not to eat late at night, like stop at like seven and the next morning, at least you've got 12 hours at least to have a break. Number three, so you want to eat a balanced whole food diet with as much diversity as you can tolerate because there's two key words, diversity and tolerate. When you have more diversity, it means you're getting more different types of bacteria and different types of bacteria are good as long as they're the good bacteria because they're going to help balance out the other good bacteria and they're going to feed and make more nutritious food because these microbes actually make B vitamins and those are essential as well that you need for as, as a cofactor from many different types of enzyme um, transformations. Tolerate, tolerate is another key word. A lot of people who have digestive concerns will come to you and they cannot tolerate any food. So finding a really, uh, a nice balance between what they can tolerate, feeding them, nourishing them is, is key. And it's really an art, it's such an art. All right, so note, please note that diet alone will not cure SIBO. Even if your client comes to you and says, but I'm eating fermented food and I have no processed food and I'm drinking a lot. And, you know, it goes on and on with this lovely, beautiful, ideal diet. And you're like, well, you still have SIBO. We, we have bacteria we have to work on right now. All right, we have seven diets. The FODMAPS diet you probably know about, specific carbohydrate diet, the GAPS diet, the autoimmune protocol slash paleo diet, SIBO specific carb diet, the SIBO biphasic diet, the SIBO histamine biphasic diet, and the elemental diet. I'm just gonna make it easy for you right now because you're probably thinking to yourself, oh my God, which one do we do? Which one do we use? Um, so I'm gonna give you my, my, just my quick summary. I do not use the FODMAPs. I do not use the carbohydrate diet, nor do I use GAPS. I go to AIP for autoimmune, and I use SIBO and SIBO biphasic. And if it's histamine, I'll use histamine. So I use three to number six. The elemental diet, I rarely use. So let's go into detail why I'm suggesting what I'm suggesting. So SIBO food aggravators, let's just first do a summary, maybe some ideas of what people can eat, but every person will react completely different. So for me, it was tomatoes. I went into total chaos for tomatoes and some People are totally fine with tomatoes, even though it's a solanine family, uh, you know, maybe they're fine with it. All right, here are some foods that are common aggravators. Onions, absolutely. Garlic, cauliflower, broccoli, soy, apple and dried fruit, raw food like salads and starchy vegetables, any fiber sources generally, legumes, peas, beans, certain nuts, almonds, filberts, pecans, dairy, wheat and gluten, potatoes, and sweet yams. So those are kind of a hit parade list. And of course, you will add on to that from people who come to you, they will add on to your list. It's very individual. Here are some foods that are commonly agreeable that will be okay for people with SIBO. And I, and, um, I want to include IBS here as well, because IBS is like, I am baffled by your symptoms. So <laughs> it could be lots of stuff. But Anyway, white rice and white rice, you're thinking it's not a carb. It certainly is. But in small, small amounts, we need a little bit of carb to help with our energy, to help with uh, feeding short chain fatty acids, which I'll talk about probably later. Olive oil, coconut oil, coconut oil, maybe olive oil, most likely sauteed bok choy and chard. So here's the thing. It cannot be raw. It needs to be sauteed and warmed. Um, chamomile tea, ginger, fennel, turmeric tea. Those are all great. Plain baked chicken, fish, lamb, and meat broth, not bone broth. It has to be a meat broth and not sitting in the pot for 24 hours, but basically four hours. So you don't want too much of fermentation and things sitting on the pot for too long. So those are kind of, you know, the do's and the don'ts in general. I'm being very general. 
Let's now be specific. Let's talk about the FODMAPs. This diet is so hot. It's crazy. And every doctor you probably meet who treats people with digestive concerns say, oh, just do the FODMAPs diet and a probiotic and you'll be fine. Well, that's actually not true. So let's go through this. So FODMAP stands for fermentable. And right off the bat, it's fermentable. What's the problem with SIBO? Fermented food, oligosaccharides, lots of fiber, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. Let's go through what they mean. Oligosaccharides include fructans and galacto-oligosaccharides. Disaccharides include lactose, maltose, sucrose food sources. Monosaccharide includes fructose. And polyols can come from natural food or synthetic sources like erythritol, sorbitol, xylitol, mannitol. So oligosaccharide means three to 14 chain carbons. Disaccharide are two, are two and monosaccharide is just one. And polyols are actually um, alcohol-based, not like alcohol you're thinking drinking, but it's an all on the end. So it's an al- has an alcohol at the end, glycerols, I think glycerols, maybe, yeah. So when we eliminate high FODMAP foods, it may reduce IBS and SIBO symptoms, maybe, such as bloating, gas, abdominal pain, diarrhea, and constipation. Let's talk about what are fructans. Fructans are uh, wheat, rye, barley, onion, garlic, Jerusalem, and globe artichoke, beetroot, dandelion leaves, white part of leeks, spring onions, bro- Brussels sprouts, savoy, cabbage, prebiotics. Sorry, just so you know, I'm kind of going through these foods. You will have access to this webinar on the IHN uh, guest panel. You can go back to it and you can watch the recording so you, can, so you don't have to rush through and write this all down. <laughs> so it's available for you. You can also do, you know, function print screen and you can use this for your own reference if you'd like to use this as for information to heal yourself. So fructose oligosaccharides, oligofructose and inulins, asparagus, fennel, red cabbage, and radicchio contain moderate amounts of, but they, but may be eaten if the advised portion size. So here we have a key point, okay? So some food can be tolerated and some cannot be. It's also very dosage dependent. So if you tell someone, oh yeah, you can eat rye, barley, onion, and they eat too much, of course, they're going to have a reaction. But if you say, okay, just have like a teaspoon or or a tablespoon, they might be okay. Let's talk about sources of galactins. They include pulses and beans, as the main dietary source, although green beans, canned lentils, spreaded bung beans, tofu, silken, and tempeh contain comparatively low amounts. So I'm just giving you an idea as to what are FODMAPs, what's it stand for, and what kind of foods am I supposed to be avoiding? Polyols. Polyols, they were natural, and the ones from fruit include apples, apricots, avocados, blackberries, cherries, lychees, nectarines, uh, watermelon, prunes, plums, and in some vegetables, including cauliflower, mushroom, and manji chow peas. Um, we have cabbage, chicory, and fennel contain moderate amounts, but may be eaten in low amounts. So I'm going to show you a FODMAP. Where am I going to show you a FODMAP thing? Yes. Yeah, so we're just going to get, just so you know, I do get to this. And you can also print this off if you want to. Also, go to Pinterest. If you go to Pinterest.com and you enter low FODMAP, you will see all types of avoid this and eat this. But it's also letting you know I do have this available for you in these slides. So I'm going to go back here and finish off the slide. So fructose and lactose, we have people following a low FODMAP diet, maybe able to tolerate moderate amounts or maybe not at all. It depends. Here's some highlights of the FODMAPs. Professor Peter Gibson and colleagues at Monash University, they're really big. So if you want to get some research about FODMAPs, go to Monash University. They have a lot of studies on this. And they claim that it alleviates signs of IBS. In 2014, a major medical journal, Gastroenterology, featured Gibson and his diet. He says it actually helped 68 to 76% improvement of IBS client patients. Uh, a low FODMAP diet restricts foods that feed bacteria in the gut. Yes, it does, but I'm going to talk about an issue I have with it. The diet avoids specific carbohydrates that are not easily absorbed, like cabbage, onion, cow's milk, goat's milk, apples, and avocados. Um, the researchers caution against the low FODMAP diet for long-term use because it may change the microbiota of the gut. Yes, and here's the problem. What do fibers break down to? They break down to short-chain fatty acids. And what is the energy source of your endothelial cells? Da-da! The short-chain fatty acids. So when you do not have 
fiber and fiber food sources or vegetables in your diet, you are not going to have a very happy microbiome. And they are not going to make the B vitamins, the different types of microbes you need for a balanced health. All right, so restricting probiotic rich fermented foods like cultured vegetables and kefir in the diet, the inner ecosystem will remain damaged because short chain fatty acids are not being provided, which is called butyrate. I usually give a butyrate supplement to those who have uh, SIBO and haven't had fiber for a long time and cannot eat fiber, we'll supplement it with a supplement capsule. All right, FODMAPs highlights. So what can I eat on FODMAPs diet? Foods that trigger symptoms vary from person to person. To ease IBS and IBD, IBD is inflammatory bowel disease and SIBO symptoms. It's essential to avoid high FODMAPs, maybe. Foods that aggravate the gut include, we already mentioned, dairy, wheat, beans, lentils, some vegetables, some fruits. Instead, now I the ones in red are the ones that I have a problem with. So eggs and meat may work. Certain cheeses such as brie, camembert, and cheddar, and feta, that's allowed on the FODMAP. I definitely would never include that for SIBO. Almond milk, I don't because it contains carrageenan, which is a, a carbohydrate source. And it also, it may be an, it's an oxalic acid source. So that can also irritate people with SIBO. Oxalates can, can irritate you. Grains like rice, quinoa, and oats, maybe oats. I don't start off with oats. I might do soaked and sprouted quinoa and soaked uh, rice. Vegetables like eggplants, potatoes, tomatoes. That's the solanine family, which may cause people problems. I would ask them about that first. Cucumbers and zucchini. Zucchini is okay. Cucumbers are very watery. I don't recommend that for people who have diarrhea. Fruits like grapes, oranges, strawberries, blueberries, and pineapple. I don't recommend fruit when you have diarrhea, um, except maybe blueberries after two weeks of treatment. Can you introduce that? So my opinion is I don't suggest cheese for the first four weeks. Actually, never usually for four to eight weeks. Nor the solanine family veggies, nor oranges and pineapple with CBOD diarrhea, as these are potential inflammatory and aggravating foods. Yet everybody, of course, is unique. All right, here's the diet. You can check it out. You can, you know, function print screen if you want or come back to the uh, recording if you want to or go to Pinterest. All right, let's move on to specific carbohydrate diet. You might know this is breaking the vicious cycle by Elaine Gottschall. We probably learned it in context with the Candida diet. So she removes, she removes polysaccharides, some oligosaccharides, disaccharides, and polyols. And it's a little more restrictive than FODMAPs. It removes the grains and all complex carbs. So now we're getting really restrictive. Um, this includes starchy veggies and all sugars. Only simple sugars are allowed with, with this diet. So it's effective in healing IBD, ulcerative colitis, and Crohn's disease, diverticulitis, cystic fibrosis, and chronic diarrhea. And some use it for treating SIBO and some don't. I don't. I think it's too restrictive. It includes a list of illegal and legal foods, which recommends strict adherence, which sounds so strict, I wouldn't want to go there. It recommends starting with an intro diet and expanding the diet. It looks like this. So illegal, this is legal, meat and illegal is this. Of course, take out all processed foods in any diet you have. Um, take out, she's taking out the beans, that's fine. But I have this red arrow says, wait a second, I got white beans, navy beans, lentils, split peas. That could cause a lot of people a lot of gas. Okay, so that's my issue with the SCD diet. Let's move on to GAPS. Remember I mentioned I don't usually use GAPS. The only time I find GAPS is helpful is for ADHD, autism, and neurological issues. It is very helpful. So if you have children with autism or adults with autism or schizophrenia or bipolar, this may be a good diet for them. It's a long-term diet. Um, and this one you utilize it for three to six weeks for the intro diet, and then you can move into other stages. So the diet eliminates nicely and hopefully artificial sweeteners, which is great, focuses on fruits. Mm, I wouldn't focus on fruits for SIBO. That's why I have it in red. Vegetables and includes probiotics. Guess what? I have clients who say, I went on a lactobacillus uh, probiotic and I got worse. So people who have SIBO will come to you and say, I'm on a probiotic, I'm okay. No, no, meaning I'm on a probiotic, I have gas, I should be okay. And you're like, well, actually, the lacto part can be causing you gas. 
All right, modifications to gap. If you are going to do the gaps diet, make sure it's a meat stock, not a bone broth. A bone broth can have that connective tissue. It has the gags and it will feed the bacteria. Um, you also want to leave four to five hours between your daytime meals so that you have the MMC. The housekeeper can come to your house to clean the bacteria away. And of course, most fermented foods are not tolerated by people with um, SIBO. So that is allowed in GAPS. And it's, I, I don't recommend that the first you know, two to four weeks of your SIBO diet, I don't recommend fermentation. Some people do add in probiotics when you have SIBO IMO, um, but it would be depending on the person and also how long they've had their SIBO for. Like, have you killed, have you killed the, the SIBO bacteria off and then move into probiotic? That's possible. If you are going to use a probiotic, you want to consider Lactobacillus casei, Plantarum faecalis, Brevis, Clausi, and Saccharomyces boulardii which is a yeast spore bacteria. And I always include this bacteria on the third week after you've killed all the bad stuff. I put in the good stuff, the Saccharomyces. All right, here's a general GAPS diet list. You can find this on, again, Pinterest. They'll go through all the stages or come back to this recording, just print it off. There are six stages to the GAP diet. So we talked about some of these foods. The ones in red I'm going to talk about, these are the ones I would not recommend for SIBO. Probiotics, I just mentioned, ferment, fermented food, yogurt, kefir, homemade fermented whey, not in the beginning, no way. Raw organic egg yolks, nope. Sauerkraut and fermented vegetables, nope. Scrambled eggs made with ghee, well, that may be okay, but the goose fat and the duck fat could be too much for somebody who has diarrhea. Stage four for the gaps, you've got freshly pressed carrot juice. No, that's not very good for blood regulation, sugar regulation, because there's no fiber in it and definitely no milk. And so that's my take going through all those stages and what would not agree for SIBO. Okay, so the full gaps diet, um, I, I don't mind the fact they avoid grains and sugars and starchy vegetables and refined carbohydrates, that's fine. This one lasts for 18 to 24 months. That can be a long time. That's almost two years. But again, I said people with autism or neurological conditions, it is helpful. Um, so the ones I, am, I do accept are eggs, fresh vegetables and fruit in certain amounts and certain vegetables that are cooked. Garlic, no, I, I don't actually include that. And then the rest seems to be okay. We've already talked about their food in terms of fermentation and broths. They recommend potatoes and fermented grains, and I don't put that in for SIBO, okay? So what I'm doing here in red is taking the stuff I don't allow for my SIBO diets. Uh, GAPS food list. So just to summarize here before we continue on the next diet, they allow meat. We can do meat stock. That's fine. We can just cook it for a shorter period of time. Meats, that's fine. Of course, hormone-free or grass-fed. Fish is fine. Shellfish depends on the person. Animal fats. Eggs, fresh fruits, it depends. Only blueberries, I'd probably recommend. Fermented foods and beverages, no, I don't. Hard natural cheeses, no, I don't. And kefir, nope. No dry wine and no white navy beans. All right, these are the ones, of course, you want to take out is sugar and artificial sweeteners, syrups, alcohol, processed and packaged foods, grains like rice, corn, wheat, and oats. Definitely chuck them out the window. Uh, starchy vegetables such as potatoes and yams, milk, beans, so we're taking a lot of stuff out, but just, you know, we're going to put them in eventually, but just not right now when you have, have SIBO. Next diet, AIP, stands for autoimmune protocol. I use this one for anyone who has longstanding autoimmune diseases. And autoimmune diseases tend to go in threes. It's a trio. You can have psoriasis, hypothyroidism, and like fibromyalgia. So there are 100 autoimmune diseases right now that people talk about in terms of science, science reports. So there's a lot of autoimmune stuff going on and it is related to SIBO. So based on the paleolithic diet, which is to avoid grains and dairy, that's pretty helpful I find for those who have autoimmune problems. So if you think the underlying cause to SIBO is also autoimmune, then I think AIP is a good diet to start with. Avoiding grains, no peas, legumes, don't consume nightshades, um, stay away from any dairy products, and avoid certain proteins such as eggs, nuts, and seeds. Well, seeds I'm okay with, like sunflower, soaked sunflower seeds, some sesame seeds, um, eggs may be okay for some people, again, depends on the person. Uh, of course, coffee, alcoholic, beverages, no, no refined sugars, oils, and food additives. That's a given for any diet. 
you can do a restrictive elimination phase if you want to for about the month to, to two months. I usually check in with all my patients, clients every week. We do a 15 minute check-in to see how you're doing on this diet. Why? I don't want them to go on a restricted diet too long without checking in. Also, diets are very much like art. And that's why I have this course for you guys, for nutritionists, because putting together a meal plan is like an artwork. You see what the client can tolerate and you see when can you introduce it. And then you also learn about the bacteria in the gut and the microbiome and how to play with that. All right. So by the end of a maintenance phase, a person should know what foods they can and can't tolerate. If they can't figure that out, you can always have them do a blood test at the IgG, IgE response to food, the, the ELISA testing, the ELISA testing, whatever it's called. All right, so let's move on to the next diet, SIBO-specific diet highlights. I like this one. This is created by Dr. Allison Seebecker. She's really very well-versed in SIBO. So SIBO-specific guidelines blends the best part of SCD, specific carb diet, with the FODMAPs. This diet excludes certain foods allowed in some of the diets and adds in foods that are banned from some of the other ones. The whole point of this diet is to radically change one's diet is to nourish our body while starving the small intestinal bacteria. That's the purpose of it. So by only eating sugars that can be immediately absorbed by the very first part of your small intestine and eating other foods that the bacteria can't digest, the bacteria will find it very challenging to repopulate and have a party in there. The diet is meant to be in conjunction with other treatments like antimicrobial uh, treatments, lifestyle changes, all kinds of things you can do to help with um, reducing inflammation and immune, helping your immune system. So my opinion here is I refer my clients to this diet if they don't have any uh, autoimmune, AI stands for autoimmune conditions, they are underweight, vegan, or cannot comply with the AIP diet. If they have autoimmune, I would tend to use this one more often. And um, if they are underweight, I would increase the dosage, for example, of quinoa, you know, start with, you know, one tablespoon, then move to two tablespoons. But I move really slowly. Otherwise, the starchy vegetables can make them regress. OK, I also love her, her um, printout. It goes from less fermentable on the left side to more fermentable on the right side. So here, this is where you can engage it and go, OK, uh, your clients, let's start on the green for this week. And they're like, okay, I'm fine with this. All right, let's introduce one food from the yellow column that you feel you can best tolerate. And then they go, ah, okay, well, I think squash is best. Everything else might be a problem. Okay, let's do one tablespoon of butternut squash to introduce that. So I like this because there's a, there's a way of playing with it a little bit easier and it's very visual. Okay, SIBO biphasic diet, the next diet. This one is um, created by Norella Jacoby. She's in Australia. It's four to six weeks. It's the phase one. Very similar to uh, Dr. Seebecker's. We're removing grains, legumes, sugar, certain vegetables, canned, canned foods, processed foods, fermented foods, and alcohol. Um, and then the first phase of the diet focuses on um, reducing starches and fibers. That's the first phase because it's necessary to starve the bacteria of their preferred fuel. And then phase one, she divides into two groups, restricted and semi-restricted. And some clients like this because it's like, are you this column or are you that column? Um, phase two is six weeks plus, is to remove and restore the gut. This phase builds on the allowable foods from phase one and introduces some dairy products and increased quantities. So here's how it looks. So this, spot, this column is restricted. So if you're really doing having a hard time, SIBO-friendly protein powders, like I would use sprouted, um, uh, what am I talking, pumpkin seed powder to begin with. And then if you're thinking, oh, I'm doing okay with this, I can introduce something else. Then the next you know, two or three or four weeks later, you might want to include soaked and sprouted, say, mung bean. And I would start with a quarter cup or even less. I may even do just like one tablespoon to see how you're doing. Okay, so this is one column. This is a second column, semi-restricted, and these are the ones to avoid. 
All right, next diet, cetohistamine biphasic diet. This is again, neural, Dr. Neurola Jacoby. Histamine is really common that goes along with SIBO. So you want to remove foods that also have histamine foods. So her diet includes that list like alcohol, pickled or canned foods, mature cheeses, smoked meat, shellfish, beans and pulses, nuts, chocolate, vinegar, ready meals, salty snacks, and leftover food will increase the histamines in your diet. So we also want to not include um, histamine liberators because that will actually enhance the effect of histamine. So nuts, papaya, beans, pulses, tomato, wheat germ, additives, of course, and citric fruits like these. So citric fruits may be a problem. The issue here is diamine oxidase DAO blockers prevent histamine reduction. So DAO blockers are foods that have the ability to prevent specific enzymes from breaking down histamine in your body. So just to be safe, you want to consider avoiding these, alcohol, black tea, energy drinks, green tea, and mate tea. If you want to supplement, you can take Histoclear or Histamine Scavenger. That may be helpful if someone comes to you. Now, there's another name just you know for histamine, and that is um, mast cell, the mast cell activation syndrome, MCAS. So if someone comes to you with MCAS, you know that you want to take them on a histamine diet. And also, I have to say, MCAS, also a very high um, chance of having SIBO as well. All right, last but not least, this is the last diet, elemental diet. It is my least favorite because it's the most, it's, the, it's a liquid diet. <laughs> it doesn't taste good. <laughs> it's expensive and people don't like it. However, let me just mention, worth mentioning studies. So in 2004, 93 patients with symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome, they claimed that do, they were doing pretty well. That they noticed a difference just by having a liquid diet. So if you have a client who's been experiencing diarrhea for a really long time and everything they're doing is not working, then sure, go on an elemental diet, see if it helps you. But I would do it week by week, not, not every two weeks. This one says after two weeks, I would do just one week of a diet and then check in with them. So after three weeks of people following this diet for this study, 85% of subjects had normalized breath tests, SIBO tests. That's pretty crazy. Um, so again, I have to tell you, a lot of people cannot do three weeks. A, diabetic potentially, hypoglycemic. They're not balancing their blood sugar balances correctly. And they may, be, um, they may have low weight already. And if they low weight, I don't want to starve them basically. And that'll leave them really tired. So I don't want that to happen. So elemental diets provide nutrients that are easily absorbable and assimilated into the body. And it does not allow bacteria to live. That's great. But here's what I'm, pro here's what I'm noticing. Someone goes on an elemental diet, right? They starve it. Okay, fine. Now they start putting back in the carbs in their diet and poof, SIBO reappears. Why? Didn't you kill all the bacteria? No, because bacteria, it's like they're having a party in, in, your ca in the candy land. And if you don't feed them, they're like, fine, I'm going to go hide in your epithelial cells and the mucous membrane in your intestinal lining. And they hide out until the food, the candy comes back for them. So same thing like the metaphor with kids in the candy, whatever, candy factory. All right, so elemental diets, they don't have any dietary fiber or prebiotics that can stimulate growth of bacteria, which could be problematic, problematic. And also it's strictly hypoallergenic, which is free from plant and animal derived proteins and peptides, which can cause problems for SIBO clients. And there's no gluten, wheat, yeast, corn, or other hard to digest nutrients. So that's really probably a nice break for somebody who couldn't eat anything. All right. Um, there are a few ways that you can take and consume elemental diets. You can take it, you know, sip it throughout the day, or you can have meals like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It depends on who they are. If they get headaches, you'll want to sip it throughout the day. Where to buy it? You can buy it at physician the, at the fullscript.com. It's called Physician's Elemental Formula. I think it's about $100, but you can sign in as nutritionist at fullscript.com and order it for them, or they can order it themselves. Or order it through your name. All right. If you want a homemade recipe or other information, you can check out my website. It's hard to see it here. It's www.marlasamuel.com, S-A-M-U-E-L. I am offering courses as well on this in terms of helping you as a nutritionist be able to really treat SIBO from start to end and give you all the handouts that you need. Um, 
The summary here on this diet, just to let you know, is it's overly restrictive, okay? If your client can handle it in their dire and need, definitely try it out. Not a problem. Go for it. Therapeutic diets are designed to be short-term elimination diets. All of these diets are short-term elimination diets. We just want to calm down the inflammation and the symptoms. You need short-chain fatty acids. This is their primary energy source for your colonocytes, for your colon, your, your epithelial cells. You need this for energy. Also, short-chain fatty acids have so many more functions in terms of gut motility, uh, reducing inflammation. So it goes on and on. You need these short-chain fatty acids. And the one particularly we want to look at is butyrate. So if they can't eat fiber, give them a butyrate supplement. All right. After the initial elimination phase, you can reintroduce food slowly and watch for obvious symptoms. So if a client says, oh, this tomato is not so good, then take it out. That's fine. Put something else in. If there are reactions, clients can continue to avoid that food. No problem. Just make sure you're trying to balance the diversity of the food. We want diverse food from more different types of bacteria. Remember, we're trying to balance the commensal, the good bacteria with the bad bacteria. We're always going to have E. coli or something in here. So we don't want too much of it. We don't want to be too high. So lower, that over, lower the overgrowth and raise the good bacteria. The purpose of this process is to help them identify their worst triggers. The longer term goal is to expand their diet as much as possible to increase the gram positive bacteria microbe ratio while avoiding eating foods that are problematic. Okay, this is my very last slide, I promise. If you think you have SIBO or your clients have SIBO, there, there's no other site out there at all except this one. So if you're in Canada, order it at www.seboclinicCanada.com. It is the only one that you can get without a doctor referral required. It costs $227 Canadian. And um, if someone has IBS or has been really struggling with wanting to figure out why they have these symptoms that we discussed, this is amazing to have this confirmation of what is going on. And in this course, if you want to learn how to interpret these tests, that is one of the lesson plans. I take you step by step in terms of the graphs. What do they look like? What's a methane dominant case? What is a SIBO diarrhea case? So you, get, you finish this going, oh my gosh, like I know how to interpret this test and I can really help this person with these protocols that are step by step. Because I know for me, when I had this, it was like I had to um, figure it out on my own. And back then, who knew about SIBO? No one talked about SIBO. <laughs> All right. If you are if you're in the states, here is a online SIBO breath test summary. Um, the arrows refer to the ones you do want to order. You want to order a three hour lactulose test. Lactulose is a substrate they use. You can also have a glucose, but you want lactulose. So these two arrows, three hours lactulose, and that's the price. That's if you're in the U.S. And that is the end of today's webinar. I really hope you got something from this, and thank you so much for joining me. And if you have any questions, uh, please ask. I'd be happy to help you. So I think that, is it Anna? Hannah. Yes. Anna. Hi, Anna. Okay. So we'll just get you to stop screen sharing. Sure. Uh, definitely. One minute. Yeah. Okay. So for some reason i'm not able to view any of the questions in the q a box um are you able to see them on your end i'm look, i'm going to click q a uh mm -hmm. i see no open questions it says is there okay. a way maybe to take them off if you want to just let them talk would that be okay no not with the webinar style unfortunately oh, I see. okay um, Unless, you know, unless maybe no one asked any questions. Maybe that's why we don't see anything there. Okay. I do see 14 participants. Yeah. Um, and I'm just going to see what's going on there. Oh, Q&A. Yes. <laughs> There's a question. In active, in active IBD and when suspected SIBO, what would be your approach? Okay. So IBD is inflammatory bowel disease for those who aren't aware. And if you suspect SIBO, just so you know, you can have IBD and SIBO at the same time. So if you do suspect SIBO, then by all means, get that SIBO test. And why do I recommend that? Because you want to know what to treat first. 
are we treating methane, the constipation, or are we treating diarrhea first? And that's your first layer. Treat this like an onion. Whatever is most on the outer part that you see, the current symptoms, that's how you're going to treat it. So I'm not sure if that's the type of answer you're looking for. Um, is, I think it's Eliane. Elian. Uh, but if, if you need to have another question about that, by all means, put another question in the chat box. But I'm just letting you know, a SIBO test definitely is great to know what to, um, what to treat first. Okay, so Dana has a question. So how do you tell the difference between candida and SIBO? Sure, great question. So there are tests you can actually have done. Um, so SIBO, you already have an idea. It's your SIBO test or breath test. And candida, you can have organic acid tests. That's done through a naturopath or, your or a gastro or your doctor. Um, I also go through all the tests that you can have done in my course. It's a slew of tests. But specifically for candida, it would be organic acid test is what you want to have done. There are other ways to you can check for candida called PCR, stool testing, but it gives you kind of the big picture. So I would do, I would do the OAT, organic acid test first. Yeah. So I hope that answered that. Okay. So oh, I want to mention one more thing. Sorry. <laughs> Just about candida and SIBO. They are intertwined because candida is SIFO, small intestinal fungal overgrowth. And just so you know, fungal, you can have 12 different types of fungus. Candida is one kind. Usually what related to SIBO, you have a candida tropicalis form and you can treat that. And by the way, the herbs that you treat SIBO with also kill candida, like oregano oil, but there's different formulas of, of supplements that you want to take and you can actually kill candida at the same time. Just, you know, yeah, but good question. Well, Marla, thank you so much. Uh, oh, do we have, oh, we have another question from Savannah. Uh, right. Which supplements would you not recommend for SIBO? Yeah. Oh. Uh, okay. So anything with prebiotics, Prebiotics will feed the probiotics, the good bacteria. So no prebiotics, no inulin, no phos, goss, moss, which is stripped oligosaccharides, man and oligosaccharides, no oligosaccharides. So no prebiotics for sure. And also check all your supplement labels. You don't want tapioca, maltodextrin. These are things that starch in your capsules, right? That's another thing we go over in the course is what supplements do you not want? Because Supplements are all going to have some kind of potato starch or dextrose. Again, these things can make it worse. So you may have a fantastic supplement like turmeric, but if it's entrenched or the excipient is in a potato starch, you're wondering why you're having reactions. It actually could be that. So that's kind of, you know, good thing. Good questions, guys. Okay. Uh, Terry asks, uh, do your courses have specific start dates or do you learn at your own pace? Yeah. So the course I'm just finishing now, we have a, I have a course going on ends next Tuesday. I was going to record the lesson. So we have weekly lessons for six weeks. It's about an hour and a half for the recorded lesson, but then we have a live session every week for about an hour and 15 minutes. So you get me live every week. And we go through cases and you answer your questions because the lesson, you can just keep the lesson and keep watching it over and over again. And there is a lot of information and not saying it's not overwhelming. I'm just saying, as you can tell, my courses, like the way I speak and the, what I offer is it's kind of dense. You know, I get right to the point. This is the information and it's very sequential and also very visual. I've got lots of pictures to look at. So the answer, the answer to your question is it's recorded weekly with, with lessons and then live every week. And all your handouts are provided to you weekly as well. Like, a, like a, they're dripped to you. Okay. So another three questions just popped up. So uh, Elian asks, depending on test results, would you start with healing the gut or treating first either SIBO or IMO? Yeah. So you want to, you know, in terms of treating the gut, it depends what your interpretation is from your SIBO test. Is it a really enhanced, what we call mega methane interpretation from your SIBO test, or is it very light and not very serious? And if it's not very serious, then we may just go with a gut protocol. So you could do things like um, 
And just remove, of course, gluten, sugar, additives, processed foods. That's your kind of your go-to. Uh, remove lactose. Those. That's your first line therapy that we always go to. And actually outlining in the course is it tells you first line therapies because you have to wait two to three weeks before you get your results back. So your client says, what am I going to do in the meantime? Well, that's what you do. You actually treat the gut, the first line therapy. Once you get the result back, then you treat it specifically. And by the way, there's different treatment for SIBO versus IMO. They are different treatments. Okay. Uh, Yvonne asks, do you offer courses or consultation for SIBO patients? I do. Um, right now it's courses. So consultations will depend on this business is very new for me. I just, you know, with COVID, <laughs> I just went online. So it depends. It does depend on how, you know, in terms of courses and how well I'm booked. You can try me out. You can definitely email me. Uh, my website, you can contact me there. Uh, which is marlasamuel.com. And I have a contact at the bottom of the page. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another question we got in the chat was, uh, you mentioned you cannot heal SIBO with diet only. Can you repeat what are the other interventions? Yes. So the other parts of treatment would be antimicrobial herbs. The other option is antibiotics, which of course we don't do. Uh, gastroenterologists would do. Now, from my research, I don't think antibiotics are a sustainable approach. If somebody wants a really quick fix, people come to me and say, I want a quick fix. Just give me a pill. Get rid of this. I'll say, well, you know what? This is about sustaining your health, your gut, not just quick fixes. Antibiotics is four weeks. Antimicrobials are between four to eight weeks. That's one, that's one way to help this. But SIBO, it depends on the underlying cause. There's, remember I mentioned SIBO is an underlying, there's something underlying SIBO. SIBO is a symptom of something bigger. SIBO is not a disease. So if it's emotional issues, we work on the emotions. If it's the H HPA axis, if you're totally stressed, which is causing that peristaltic and no MMC housekeeper coming, we work on that level HPA first. Um, so yeah, so I'm hoping that I answer that question. I'm not sure where that question was again. <laughs> I'm trying to find it in the chat box here. Um, oh, uh, depending on the test results, is that what it says? Yeah. The other interventions. Yeah. So antimicrobials and lifestyle for sure. So lifestyle, we work a lot on the vagus nerve. How can we innervate that? How can we support you? And how can we support the five main levels, which is HPA, HBT, blood regulation, gut health, and EFA status. So we work on all those levels. Okay. Well, Marla, thank you so much. That seems to be all the questions that we uh, have so far. So thank Great. you so much for sure. our yeah. Very <laughs> insightful information with us. Your uh, presentation really gave us clarity on SIBO and IMO with uh, tangible steps that we can use for ourselves or in practice. And uh, you're a wealth of knowledge. So we're just so fortunate to okay. learn from you. And thank you. Uh, thank you to all of our attendees who joined us today. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us this evening. And Marla, it was great to connect with you. Yeah, yeah. great to connect with you too. And thank everybody for coming. Hope to see you again. Have a good night. Thank you. You too. Bye, everybody. Bye.